Welcome to the Aurora Institute Symposium 2020 virtual sessions. Thank you everyone for joining us today. My name is Susan Patrick. I'm the president and CEO of Aurora Institute, and I'll be moderating today's session. As you may know, we shifted our in-person symposium to a virtual convening in the wake of COVID-19. We'll be hosting a virtual symposium on October 26th through 28th, so please save those dates. We're also hosting an all fall webinar series. These are our symposium sessions that these began in August and we'll be extending them through November. It's leading up and following the main conference and we hope to cover key topics on trends, research, and the kinds of sessions you've come to expect from the Aurora Institute. We hope you'll join us for our virtual symposium and we have more than 20 sessions over 15 weeks to learn from and participate in. Today's webinar is on assessing field level change, lessons from the evaluation of the assessments for learning project. This webinar will explore important topics on the methods and the evaluation of the assessment for learning project, the field in service of educational equity. Next slide, please. So as we get started, please introduce yourselves in the chat. We're gonna use the chat today to pose questions for all of our panelists, but please feel free to share insights, um, introduce yourself, your organization, share any tools or resources that are related to the work that you're hearing about. We hope to engage you and share your own experiences with everyone who's participating throughout today's session. So please, Keep using the chat box, and as you have questions, we'll be doing a Q&A at the end. We're also on Twitter using hashtag Aurora2020 and at Aurora-INST. Stay connected and share your insights with your own networks, peers, and learning communities inside this session and outside on social media. Today's session will be recorded and we will be archiving the webinar. This will be on our website. We'll send you a follow-up email within the next few days with the slides and the recording. This session is part of a special research series on building the evidence base for K through 12 personalized learning. Next slide. So please join me today in welcoming today's presenters, Daniela Berman and Heather lewis Sharp from the Social Policy Research Associates and Ann Jacob, the Executive Director of Stanford Center for Opportunity Policy and Education, or SCOPE. Thank you so much for being here to share your research. Daniela, I'll turn it over to you. Thank you, Susan. Well, welcome everyone, and thanks so much for joining us today. And a big, big thank you to the Aurora Institute for this opportunity to share what we've been doing and learning with our colleagues in the field. Next slide, please. So we're very excited today to share with you our work over the last four years with the Assessment for Learning project. And as a roadmap for our session, we'll start with some introductions and then give a brief overview of the Assessment for Learning project, or ALP. We'll spend most of our time taking a deep dive into our approach to evaluating field building through the project, especially focusing on how we apply field frameworks social network analysis, and storytelling and story catching to understand how fields grow and change. And finally, we'll wrap up with some time for Q&A. Next, please. So we'd like to start with some quick introductions to our team. My name is Daniela Berman. I'm the Assistant Director of the Education Division at Social Policy Research Associates, or SPR. We are a research evaluation and technical assistance firm located in Oakland, California. I'd also like to introduce my amazing colleagues and co-directors for the project we're talking about today. Heather Lewis Sharp, who is the Director of the Philanthropy, Equity, and Youth Division at SPR, and Dr. Ann Jaquith, Executive Director of SCOPE, a research center at the Graduate School of Education at Stanford University. Next, please. So now we'd like to know who you are. So we're going to show a poll on the screen and please select the option that best describes your role. OK. 
Give a couple more seconds. Great. So it looks like we have quite a few researchers with us, um, uh, some educators, a couple of policymakers, and folks who represent other sectors. Welcome, welcome. We can close the poll. All righty, next slide, please. So now that we know who you are, we'd like to know where you are. So we're going to take this slide as a way to see where we are all are across the country and maybe even the world and as practice for an activity that we're going to do a little bit later on. So on your Zoom screen, I'd like you to find the View Options button. So for most of us, it's going to be on the top of the screen, but for some it might be three dots elsewhere on the screen. So once you find that, you're going to click on Annotate. And this should open up a menu of annotation tools. I see some of you have got it already. So hover over the option that says stamp and then select the star. Then use the star stamp to show us on the map where you are. And if you're outside the US, you can use the text annotate tool to write in your location on the bottom of the map. Great. Looks like we have folks from all over joining us. Got East Coast, West Coast, some folks in the middle. Excellent. Thank you. Okay, so we can clear that and go to the next slide, please. Lastly, we'd love to know what you hope to get out of this session today so that we can try to meet your learning goals. So please just take a minute and in the chat box, let us know your thoughts on the following questions. What drew you to this session and what do you hope to learn? Give it another 30 seconds to a minute. Thank you, everyone. These are really great questions, um, and I'm optimistic that we can answer many of these today. And as Susan said, please, as we go through, we welcome questions and insights in the chat. So now I am going to turn it over to Anne to tell us about the Assessment for Learning project. Next slide, please. Thanks everybody for, um, for joining us today and it's exciting to be with you to tell you a little bit about the work that we've done with the Assessment for Learning Project and for the Assessment for Learning Project. 
Um, as some of you may know, the Assessment for Learning Project is a multi-year grant program and field building initiative that launched in 2015 and is funded by the William and Flora Hewlett Foundation and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. ALP is led by the Center for Innovation in Education at the University of Kentucky in partnership with Next Generation Learning Challenges. ALP was designed to fundamentally rethink the roles that assessment can and should play to advance student learning and improve K-12 education in the United States. And an important and animating idea of the Assessment for Learning project is that it is not possible to achieve excellence without equity. Therefore, assessment practices must, be sim must simultaneously become levers for improving individual students' opportunities and capacities to learn and for achieving more equitable outcomes. In the initial stages of the project, ALP really seeded innovation in the field through its unique approach to grant making and through its efforts to create a learning network. From the outset, ALP has focused attention on learning. The project developed its own learning agenda and has been guided by that learning agenda. And in this way, ALP has embodied a personalized learning approach paying attention to and designing activities that respond to the unique and evolving needs of its grantees. In many ways, just like a goal of personalized learning is to make each student's um, educational experience responsive to his or her talents, interests, and needs, we can think of the ALP leadership team um, as seeking to do that as well, to make participation in the ALP network responsive to the particular needs of its grantees and to nurture relationships among its grantees, and in so doing, create capacity for the practice of assessment for learning in the broader field. Next slide, and I'm going to turn it over to uh, Heather, I believe. Yes, oh, no, maybe it's Danny. Yeah. Hi, everybody. We're so pleased to be here and sharing this work. It's really close to our hearts. Um, so uh, I'm going to give a little quick overview of what we're going to be talking today uh, about, which is um, our approach to field building. Um, SBR has established a really good foundation in evaluating field building efforts over the last 10 to 15 years. As Daniela is going to share with you all, we have found that a unifying conceptual framework is really crucial for grounding a, frame, uh, a field building evaluation because field development can be a really amorphous and abstract thing to study, right? And so having a really sound framework can serve as a guide for the creation of evaluation tools, such as our interview protocols and surveys. Um, as with all of our evaluation work, we feel it's really important to use a combination of different methods, qualitative and quantitative. Thus, um, for this evaluation, we used social network analysis, surveys, in-depth phone interviews, document review, lots of observation, and story catching as key approaches in our evaluation of the assessment for learning project. And we're going to talk really in depth about two of these strategies today, um, social network analysis and um, story catching, but they were all really important um, for our evaluation. Um, most importantly, however, it is important to underscore that the, the goal of the evaluation is both formative and summative. So it's summative in that we want to document outcomes and change over time. That's really important. But it was also really important to us that it be formative, that the information that we gathered could feed information back to the ALP leadership team um, and other stakeholders that would inform their work in a meaningful way. So we created numerous like quick turnaround deliverables over the course of the evaluation, which were designed to guide decision making um, on the part of the ALP leadership. We made a lot of interesting conversations along the way about the data as it emerged. And in short, you know, we really feel it's important that the evaluation not only describe field building, but it also be a lever for promoting field building. And now I'm going to hand off to Danny. Next slide. He's going to talk about um, the frameworks that we use. Thanks, Heather. So as Heather mentioned, frameworks can be really useful tools to track and understand the development of fields and their strength and health over time. And in particular, when we use frameworks, we're able to clearly see how a field grows over time across multiple measures of field health. 
And it also lets us understand what key strengths of a certain field might be. So things like policy support or strong leadership. And also what are the needs a field might have like funding or a well-developed evidence base. Now from the standpoint of field building, understanding a field's strengths and areas of need can also help those needs and strengths become strategic levers to use to grow the field. So for example, if we find that a field is particularly strong in say grassroots leadership, but weak in policy support, we can design field building initiatives and investments that leverage the strength of folks on the ground um, and specifically target the policy sector. And then using the framework, we can see over time how that field changes as a result of our efforts. So in practice, we use frameworks to organize our evaluation data collection activities, such as interviews, focus groups, or surveys, and we tailor our tools to capture information that can provide a robust and data-rich picture of each component of the framework. Next slide, please. So over the years, we've used and adapted a number of different frameworks out there to look at fields, but one that we find particularly powerful is called the Strong Field Framework. This framework was originally created through a partnership between the James Irvine Foundation and the Bridgespan Group, and we've adapted it in small ways over time based on our own experience and expertise with evaluations of field building. So the Strong Field Framework has five major components that you can see here. And under each header in the bulleted list are examples of each component that we tailored specifically for the ALP evaluation. So starting from the left, we begin with shared identity. So the extent to which people working in and on a particular topic, like assessment for learning, actually see themselves as members of a collective field with a shared vision. The next component is leadership and grassroots support meaning the presence of influential organizations working to advance the field and a broad base of support from key stakeholders at the grassroots level, like educators and students and families. Third in the middle is standards of practice. So the extent to which there are codified practices or values across the field, and then systems that support those practices like professional learning. In the purple, we have knowledge base, which refers to having a well-developed evidence or knowledge base across the field, and then how widely understood or recognized that knowledge base is. And finally, in the orange, funding and policy support, which looks at the extent to which a field is contributing to policy and systems change, and also the extent to which the field has the financial resources for catalyzing and sustaining that change. So I'm going to let you take another minute to just read over these elements that we tailored for the assessment for learning field, and then we'll talk about how we used this strong field framework in the evaluation of ALP. Great, let's go to the next slide. So we used the framework in a number of ways throughout the evaluation um, and most visibly in the annual interviews and surveys that we did. So in the interviews, we asked folks to tell us how they would assess each component of the field using those bulleted statements that you saw on the last slide and then tell us why they gave that assessment. And the survey was similar, but we asked respondents to provide a rating on a scale of strongly disagree to strongly agree with each statement. So what you see in this slide here are the results from the surveys combined over three years. So we can see that over the three years, the field increased in strength along all five components of the framework, with the smallest increase being in funding and policy support, and the largest increase in standards of practice which we think was at least partially due to the ripple effects of ALP. So not only was this interesting for ALP to see the change in the assessment for learning field over time, but it was also a useful tool to understand where to focus their energy and efforts in each successive year of the initiative. So for example, between 2018 and 2019, 
ALP made a distinct effort around supporting their grantees to step into field leadership and to invite other leaders from the grassroots to policy levels into the field of assessment for learning. And if you look at the graph, between those two years, we see a good jump in the area of leadership and grassroots support from an average rating of 2.5 to 2.8. And uh, in another example, between 2019 and 2020, the ALP network focused pretty intently on solidifying principles of assessment for learning that could guide standards of practice across the field which we see reflected as a jump in the area of standards of practice from an average rating of 2.2 to 2.6. And after the 2020 survey, it becomes clear that one area for focused attention for the field and for ALP is in garnering funding and policy support to sustain the field moving forward. Next slide, please. Okay, so now we're going to do an activity and actually practice with the strong field framework by looking at the broad field of personalized learning. So on the slide we're going to show in just a moment, you'll see some components of the framework along with one statement each and a continuum that goes from strongly disagree to strongly agree. And for each statement, I'd like you to assess where you think the personalized learning field is along that continuum of agreement. If you remember the annotate tool, we're going to use the stamp feature again to drop a star along that continuum where you think the field is for each component. Okay, let's try it. Let's go to the next slide. So I'll give you a couple of minutes to read each statement and show us with the stars where you think the personalized learning field is for each component. Go ahead and get started. So this is really interesting. It looks like the most agreement in this group is around the statement about leadership and grassroots support, that there is a broad base of constituencies that are engaged in personalized learning. And then maybe the most opportunity for the field to grow is around standards of practice. So having well-developed training and PD programs to support folks around personalized learning. And very interestingly, it looks like there is a range of agreement around knowledge base. Um, the statement being that the knowledge base around personalized learning is understood by teachers and other school stakeholders. So perhaps that's another area for inquiry to find areas of alignment and intersection. Well, thanks everyone so much for engaging in that with us. That was really interesting. Um, so frameworks are a really useful way to understand field change and strength over time, but by themselves they only tell one piece of that field building story. So I'm going to turn it back to Heather now to talk about another way that we explore field building. Thanks, Danny. Um, as Danny described, Danielle described, there are many elements that help to build a strong field, such as a shared vision, standards of practice, knowledge base, and so on. But another important measure of a field's development is its connectivity. Connectivity is critical for promoting flow of information and resources, as well as enabling the exchange of ideas and the mobilization of varied capacities and assets within a field. Social network analysis is the way in which we measure quantitatively changes in connectivity. 
The simplest description of social network analysis is that it is the study of social relations among a set of actors. It's an invaluable tool for us um, to help. It helps us measure changes in these relationships, such as growth in the number of individuals or organizations that are engaging in the work of the network, shifts in the composition of the network, that is who is engaged in the network and who is connected to whom. In a strong and cohesive field, you would want to see connections across different types of organizations within the field growing over time. So in the educational field, for, for example, you want to see state policymakers communicating with district leads around assessment reform, you want to see growth in the numbers of districts and schools engaged in the reform effort over time and the degree to, and connections between those different districts so there's an exchange of best practices and ideas and learning. Um, social network analysis also helps us understand the quality of connections between actors. That is whether individuals are collaborating deeply with one another or they just know each other, you know. And then finally, social network analysis helps us understand who the most influential individuals or organizations are within the network. That is, it helps us understand who's really pivotal for bridging or connecting different parts of the network to one another. Next slide. So here, I'm going to describe a little bit more about social network analysis so that you understand the maps I'm going to show you in the subsequent slides. Social network data is gathered through surveys, which ask respondents to provide demographic information, as well as to rate their relationship to others in the network. We then use quantitative analysis software and mathematical formulas to present graphical information about patterns and structures within the network that tell a story about how information or power might flow within a network. So as I show you the network maps on the following slide, the thing to keep in mind is that each dot, which in social network lingo is called a node, so each node or dot, represents an individual or organization within the assessment for learning network. Um, two I show you will be individuals, one will be organizations. So the lines between those nodes or dots represent relationships between those individuals or organizations. So when you're looking at the map, proximity between two dots or nodes um, re reflects the strength of the relationships between, uh, strength of the direct um, and shared connections between two individuals or organizations. Individuals with more connections tend to be more centrally located within the map, and individuals or organizations with fewer connections tend to be more peripheral to the network map. That is, they are farther from the center. Next slide. So this map um, from our ALT evaluation shows you um, changes in the overall size of the network over the course of the evaluation. So um, these are individuals. The yellow dots represent ALP green teas. Um, the purple dots, ALP leadership or advisors. The green dots, which you can't see many of, are ALP funders. And blue dots are other. They're partners or other engaged stakeholders working um, around assessment and learning, but they're not grantees and they're not part of leadership. So this map clearly shows that the network grew considerably over the course of the evaluation from 189 members in 2018 to over 700 members in 2020. And as illustrated by the flood of additional blue dots, the vast majority of these new network members were partners or engage other engaged stakeholders rather than grantees or ALP leadership. And as highlighted in the pink box, we documented an increase of over 5,000 connections over the course of the evaluation. So those are 5,000 relationships or new types of relationships that were formed. Next slide. So this next graphic shows a little bit more about the composition of the network. And this graphic shows you organizations, not individuals. So the light blue are post-secondary institutions. The orange or yellow are, are school district or charter systems. The black are state education agencies. The purple are policy research or TA or professional learning organizations, basically education intermediaries. Again, you've got green uh, for the funder and then other. Um, so if you look at that kind of 2018 graphic, a picture of the network, 
When we originally went over these findings with the ALP leaders in 2018, we pointed out that there were few post-secondary institutions that were engaged in the network. There are also pretty not that many state educational agencies engaged in the network. And this seemed important because teacher training is housed within post-secondary institutions and most education policy is set at the state level. And this information helped ALP to think strategically about how they wanted to grow and strengthen their network over time. Um, and you can see that by 2020, they had made significant progress in engaging post-secondary institutions and state education agencies. Um, and they, but the, the post-secondary institutions really are not more around research and less around teacher training, so that remains an area for ALP to expand their network and engage them further. Uh, but they also engage many more schools and districts, which is of course pivotal if there's going to be educational change. Next slide. Finally, through social network analysis, we were able to see changes in the composition of who is most central in the network. And this is important because in order for field building efforts to be successful, there needs to be a broad cross section of leaders who are ready to carry it forward. People that are really invested in, in the field and pushing it forward. Further uh, more, ALP really wanted the initiative to continue more grantee led, like I think Danny mentioned. They wanted to promote grantee leadership. This was an important priority for them, and the social network analysis allowed us to tell that story in a very concrete way. So if you if you look at the pictures, you can see that in 2018, ALP leadership for the purple dots in the network were the most central and therefore the most connected actors in the network. And that, that's really to be expected at the beginning of any initiative or even where we were in the initiative's development. But by 2020, they were joined by many more grantees represented by the yellow dots and their partners through the blue dots. The relationships of all these central players in the network also became more dense. They became more closely connected, illustrating a large and diverse group of leaders who were engaged in the assessment for learning field and really um, taking responsibility for helping to drive that field forward. So in sum, social network analysis is a very powerful way to understand the essential role that relationships play in helping to foster ideas and to push forward innovation. Clearly, however, dots and lines can't fully capture the ways in which these assessment reforms are making a difference for students and teachers. And for that part of the story, I'm gonna hand it off to my co-director for the study, Dr. Ann Jacobs. Next slide. Thanks, Heather. Yeah, so one of the things that we wanted to understand is what were the grantees doing um, with respect to assessment for learning and how were they supporting in some case organizations, educators, schools and districts. And one of the ways that we wanted to approach this understanding is through um, storytelling and story catching. Um, what I mean by story catching is that we really wanted to listen to the stories of the teachers, of the students, and of the administrators who were involved in developing the assessments for learning and most importantly, um, using those assessments for learning and developing an array of practices to support the effective use of those assessments for learning. As we endeavored to learn about how these assessments were used, particularly interested in learning from the full array of individuals who participated, and we recognized that um, individual students and teachers and administrators also might have different experiences with these assessments for learning, and we wanted to understand sort of the full range of complexity. We anticipated that because of the unique vantage points of these individuals, um, their experiences and insights um, would be different and the challenges that they experienced in using these assessments for learning would be different. We anticipated that um, 
the stories that they might have to tell us would be different from one another, much like the two images of the Brooklyn Bridge differ from one another on the slide in front of you. And it was important for us to um, understand the nuance in, of difference in those stories. Next slide, please. So as we sought to uh, gather stories from the field, we were guided by these two questions on the slide. To what extent are changes in, assess in assessment practices and beliefs actually occurring in the field among the grantees? And how are these changes affecting student and teacher experience? Uh, click, please, the slide, and there's, thank you. Um, and so once we uh, focused on what we were going to try to understand or had figured out what we wanted to understand, then we needed to think about how we were going to go about developing that understanding. And so there was a series of design and methodological decisions that we needed to make. And the very most important decision is whose story to tell. And this was, um, for to answer this question, we worked closely with the ALP leadership team because they had in 2015 or so about 17 grantees that they had um, invested in and who were doing this work. And that was going to be too many to do the sort of qualitative data collection um, that we had the resources that we had the resources for. So we worked closely with them and selected a handful of grantees to learn from and to learn with. And we knew that we wanted the um, grantees to represent their full range, which included individual schools, charter school organizations, public school districts, and intermediary organizations or technical assistance organizations who work to support educators. We also, um, knew that, as I said, we wanted to talk to the range of uh, participants in these places, the, the, the students who are experiencing the assessments for learning, the teachers, the administrators who are trying to create the conditions for teachers to use these assessments for learning. And we knew that we wanted to have an opportunity to collect data on the ground um, to see what these practices looked like. So one of the first things that we did is had conversations with the grantees to ask them, what are the assessments for learning that seem to be showing the most practice in your particular setting? And what might we be able to come and see that would show us what it looks like when these assessments for um, learning are in use? And then we also had conversations with the array of actors to find out what was working well and where the challenges were. And understanding the challenges and the kinds of adjustments that they needed to make was a really important part of the story that we wanted to tell because we wanted grant other grantees and the broader field to be able to learn from their experiences. So we, um, we made sure to keep the, the users of these assessments at the center of our storytelling and our story catching and, um, and, stayed, and stayed alert to the opportunities that the field as well as the individuals who are telling the stories might be able to learn through this process. Next slide, please. So we'd like to take a minute and just ask you all to reflect on the work that you're involved in. Um, what kinds of questions might you like to explore further in your own work? If you uh, think through the, the storytelling lens, are there stories um, that aren't being told about the work that you're involved in or stories that might need to be caught, if you will, um, if there was sort of a, a, a broad lens for listening to what's going on in whatever project you might be engaged in your own work. And if you wanna just take a minute and enter some thoughts into the chat, we would love to, to know what you're working on.
There's a couple. I'll wait another 20 seconds or so and see if any others pop up. These are great questions. Um, I think that the, the, the questions that are showing up in the chat about um, how to capture the stories of students who are using these kinds of assessments, or how does assessment for learning influence student engagement, um, and for which kinds of students do they in influence engagement and in which kinds of ways. These are sort of the really nuanced kinds of questions that I think um, storytelling and story catching is good for. Um, I'm just reading. I'm just reading through the questions. These are, these are great questions. And so um, let's go to the let's go to the next slide and I'll tell you a little bit about how we tried to design some of the nuance in into our process. Um, as we worked with uh, as we worked with the educators to listen to their stories and to listen to the array of stories that existed in a particular place around a particular assessment for learning practice, such as the co-design of assessment rubrics, um, as one example, the process of listening to these stories became an opportunity for the folks that we talked with to actually reflect on and make sense of what they were doing. And so the process itself became an opportunity for learning um, by those who were engaged in the telling of their stories, as well as a, an opportunity to share knowledge with the broader ALP network and its grantees, and then for the broader field, because all of the stories that we have told about this project are, are public. And we can put a link in the chat to where you can get those, either on the ALP network or on um, SCOPE's website. The, um, the stories focused on each story focused on a particular assessment for learning practice and how that practice was actually developed and then integrated into classrooms, schools, and district routines. And the integration process became an opportunity for another rich kind of learning about what are the conditions that need to be in place to support the use and the effective use of assessment for learning. So um, an example might be uh, we wrote about the process that Delago Academy used to co-develop assessment rubrics with students and with um, and with real sort of experts in the field of science as one example. Um, another example is we learned about and and described the practices that for creating identity safe spaces where meaningful peer to peer feedback could occur at leadership public schools. And as we went deeply into that story, we were able to hear from different teachers about how they created these identity safe spaces in their classrooms. And in the process of doing that, the leadership public schools actually learned more from one another about how teachers were working in isolated classrooms were doing that work. Um, finally, we another one of our memos describes um, the design and system-wide enactment of formative assessment practices that were used to provide learning-focused feedback to students, to teachers, 
and to administrators in a high poverty school district in Arizona. And this was a nice example of how in the process of the project, this district was learning on multiple levels. Schools were working, one school in particular was working unto itself to develop these practices and was also teaching the broader district about how to engage other schools in this process. Next slide, please. So finally, um, the so finally, because we wanted the stories that we were catching and the way in which we were going to choose to tell these stories to um, assist ALP in its efforts to support its network of grantees and the organizations that they serve to learn from one another and with each other, we wanted to tell these stories in a, in a format that was going to build learning in the field. So each one of the stories has a section that really underscores and reminds people of the purpose of using assessments for learning rather than an evaluative assessment of the learning that occurred. Each story pulls out big ideas and key insights that we learned from the uh, storytellers, if you will. Um, and then each, of course, at the heart of each story is the actual assessment for learning story from that particular place. And we draw heavily on the voices of the students and the teachers and the administrators in telling that story so that it really sits as their story. And then importantly, I think there were also two additional components of the format that we used. We have a section in each one of these memos that pull out challenges that we discovered um, that each of the practitioners experienced along the way and, and that we think are useful for other members in the field to be cognizant of. So for instance, one of the challenges that came up uh, was the need to, shred, to shed entrenched ways of doing things in order to be able to develop feedback practices that lead to more equitable opportunities for learning. And this was a, a, a need that came up in many of the stories that we, we caught, if you will. Another challenge that we discovered um, is the vast demands for continuous learning within and across different levels of a system that are associated with making a school system more equitable and just. It's, it's a really enormous challenge to try to uh, assess and in a way that is um, equitable and leads to more just um, and, culturally, um, and culturally thriving outcomes for, this, for students. And then finally, uh, each one of the stories that we told ends with a small number of reflection questions for the readers. And these are intended to focus attention on the specific practices that were described in the memo and to spark readers' consideration of their own efforts to advance more equitable, just, and opportunity-oriented assessments focused on meaningful learning. And so the form was also intended to help um, structure continued opportunities for learning and development of the field. So with that, let's go to the next slide. And I think, um, I think that uh, this wonderful quotation from Mahana um, kind of captures the essence of the approach to the storytelling and the story catching that, you know, ultimately stories uh, are not only, not only help us learn from the past and from practice, but they're also intended to be told in a way to help shape the future. So I think with that, we will go to the next slide and see if there are any questions that you have for us and any of the three of us would be happy to answer them. And there may have been some that have been popping up in the chat too. 
Great, and thank you, and Heather and Daniela. Please uh, go ahead and add questions for the Q and A in the in the chat here. I wanted to uh, follow up on the prompt earlier. Um, Nancy Gerson said how one of the questions that she had was how to better capture the stories of students who are using these kinds of assessments for learning models. And I recall actually at, at a um, back when we could meet in person in Santa Fe a few years ago, there was an assessments for learning meeting where they had a student voice gallery walk that had captured videos of students and their assessments for learning projects. They were capstone projects from communities and examples of their authentic work, um, poetry, it was quite remarkable. I mean, there were dozens and dozens of these um, examples. So just, just thinking about um, ways that we can capture student voice and the, the stories of students. I don't know if you have others or if um, Daniela or Heather want to weigh in on that idea um, that Nancy highlighted. Yeah, that student voices um, exhibition was really um, was very powerful, and it was organized by the ALP leadership, and they got all of the grantees to contribute to gather the student voices and then contribute to this joint kind of exhibition that they put on. Um, and um, it was just an example also of co-construction of the way in which they engaged the grantees to construct something together, which was really powerful, and it was another kind of Core component of the ALP initiative was to work in this uh, as partners with grantees. And then grantees, a number of grantees, and probably Danny knows this better than me, but a number of grantees then adopted and put together their own student voices um, exhibitions in their own communities, in their own districts, um, their own schools, and ALP helped support some of that work through smaller learning grants. Um, the student voices installation was also then used um, as an outward facing field building tool actually at the well, what was called INICOL symposium um, later that year um, in the in the exhibition room um, ALP put up a number of full-size posters with QR codes so that participants in the symposium could walk through and using the QR codes um, listen on their phones to students talking about what it feels like when they experience assessment for learning practices and what it feels like when they don't. Yeah, those were really powerful and thank you for the shout out to <laughs> the symposium. Um, we're, we're grateful for that. And kind of tying this together, you know, our, our mission at Aurora is advancing education systems transformation. And I just think that assessments for learning um, and shifting how we think about um, systems of assessments is so critical in this, in this country. Um, and, you know, you mentioned in the assessments for learning project and in this field, um, but the grantees are individual schools, charters, districts, and some intermediary organizations and, and states um, are involved too. And I'm just wondering from the systems change, if you can talk a little bit about, because um, I've just found this crucial, as we go to states, the state departments of ed are, um, interested in this and that really have um, capacity limits. They are so busy um, in the work that they're involved with. How do intermediary organizations, these nonprofits that are often supporting communities of innovative practice, how do they play an important role in the systems change and, and field building from the research that you've done? Trying to see if I have a like a really great answer to that. So you guys pitch in if you do. Um, I think that they emerged as real leaders within this. One of the great things about ALP was the fact that it was such a diverse group, right? So it promoted learning in such a um, it promoted like, promoted learning, and that you know that could be a critique of the initiative initially that they were kind of not they were very different from each other. But that ended up being a great asset. So the intermediary organizations, for instance, that were engaged started playing more of a technical assistance role and engaging 
um, in engaging the districts. They would move across these different the different grantees, and they actually ended up promoting a lot of learning um, within within the actual like field or ALP learning community itself. Yes, I didn't know. There was another question too. I think this is directed for Anne. Um, it's from Christiane Riley. She asks, she's asking about the um, the storytelling and how you. This is more of a researcher question. How you then code in the themes? Do you then code in the themes that you're seeing emerging from the stories as a way to advance knowledge? How how do you take those stories and and build that out? Yeah, and Christine and I just had a, an exchange in the chat too about that. <laughs> um, yeah, so, and I think she's right. I mean, it allows for both a very situated way to develop knowledge and then to also um, look across um, and uh, look across these different stories of the grantees. But I was gonna go back and just add to the question, Susan, that you were asking about um, the role that intermediary organizations can potentially play in helping to develop systems wide change. And I think one, one, I think they have a really important role to play, which is in working in partnership with, with schools um, or with districts, as is in the case in Sunnyside. And we wrote about, we wrote about this um, in a couple of different memos, that they bring technical expertise and they also bring experience from having worked with other schools in other districts from, in the case of West Ed, around the country. <clears throat> and so they are bringing both particular um, experiences um, and an array of experiences to the technical assistance they provide in an individual you know, location. And what's really important about that is I think that part of the way uh, ultimately policymakers can get convinced that this is, um, that this is an approach that is going to make a difference for students is if there's sufficient capacity on the ground for it to actually make a difference. And um, so having, having intermediary organizations and folks that have developed particular technical capacity to be able to share and support others in developing that knowledge is really critical. And then I think also there are certainly skills um, and there are certainly skills and approaches that transfer across context, but part of this work and even the willingness of teachers to engage in this work is very context specific also. And so I think it's important to um, be able to support the individual context in developing its capacity. So in that way, I think technical assistance organizations have a really important role to play in this work. Yeah, you see this show up over and over again. Even um, Pat Fitzsimmons from Vermont asked a question in the chat around just, just in the work that they're doing, how do you tie together um, from the profile of a graduate that the state might have or, a, or even a community might have, how do you tie in performance assessments? But I think it's all pointing to kind of a higher, higher level of back early in your presentation, you talked about um, assessing the field and where fields are. And one of those areas uh, was in standards of practice. So what are the guidelines and best practices to ensure quality of assessments for learning and, and assessment literacy? Like how, how do we build capacity and knowledge in educators, but also in parents and communities of policy makers? It's really students to self-assess, building that knowledge around what makes quality assessment. Uh, and that has to do with um, rubrics, it has to do with forms of evidence. Uh, I, I would just say in our study of global education systems change that I, I find in many other countries the assessment literacy muscle has been far more built out as we have been so reliant on a particular form of assessment for accountability that this, these are new muscles and having the ALP project um, just in its existence with its grantees has been so remarkably important for the field. 
just as a last piece, can you go back to that standards of practice? Can you point us to any insights on guidelines or best practices for quality assessments for learning? I mean, what have you seen or learned about that? Kind of quality standards, essentially. <laughs> Anne, go ahead. Go ahead, Danny. No, 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 I was gonna direct it to you. <laughs> Susan, I actually stopped and was reading Nancy's note in the chat. So you were asking about quality. I can't do two things at once. You were asking about quality standards um, for assessments for learning. Is that? Yeah, essentially, I was pointing back to um, an earlier slide. And I know we're, we're at time. So, so we may need to follow up or perhaps blog on this important topic. And give well, the, one, the uh, one thing that I would say that I think is really important um, theme that emerged across the, the story catching that we did is the importance of co-design and co-design with students. And I think that that is a really critical component of developing students' agency and helping to understand more distinctly what students' individual needs are and the kinds of feedback that they need to get in order to advance their own learning. And there were an array of ways in which the different grantees developed a co-design approach. Um, but I think that's a really important principle. And to do that in a way where students have um, authentic voice and are really being asked what they think and what they need is a part of this unlearning that needs to happen in the field. It's a very um, untraditional way of approaching working with students and the power differential needs to, that, that dynamic needs to be taken apart. Great, I know we're at time. I just wanna thank you so much. Um, ending on that note of co-design uh, really resonates and thank you for all of the work that you're doing and um, for presenting on our, on our session today. Um, and just for all of you that are attending, this session was recorded. It will be archived um, on our website and freely available, and we'll be emailing, emailing you. Um, please stay in, in touch, and, and thank you for uh, the resources that you've shared. Um, for um, everyone that attended, we'll be sending out a one minute survey about the webinar and we uh, value your feedback and appreciate the comments. We hope you'll continue to join us for the all fall webinar sessions um, that are running through October and November and that you will um, save the date for our symposium conference, October 26th through 28th, three days of uh, incredible learning. Feel free to check out the resources on our website and follow our social media channels. Thank you so much uh, to everyone and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Take care, bye-bye.